What's up guys, it's Lionel back again with another video and today we are going to cover 100 concepts you need to know with JavaScript. A uh, fun fact is I was actually recording episode 2 of the Learn to Co Code Crash Course going over computer science. The Crash Course computer science thing that we started yesterday with the intro episode 1. I recorded all of episode 2, gave commentary and everything. But it turns out I had a little bit too much of the wine and the mic was not on. There was no sound. So I'm not about to do that again. Not tonight. That will be tomorrow. But we're going to switch it up and go to JavaScript. 100 concepts that you need to know. Let's get into it. <clears throat> Stay hydrated. Drink your water. 100 JavaScript concert. Shout out to Fire Ship. You're the man, bro. Little little backstory. I remember when I first wanted to be a developer. Uh, I watched this video. I mean, I was like already halfway, you know, grinding. JavaScript. Stuff. It's a wonderful programming My language to learn for beginner. I was grinding. I'm like, okay, this guy. I like him. He talks fast. It's a lot of information, but let me just play it in the background see what happens i did not understand i understood maybe like five things out of this 100 things but now i'm pretty good with all 100 so i'm going to try and give my um you know feedback deliberation on this excuse me still a little little tipsy but we're going to work it out let's get into it it's also a horrible programming language to learn for beginners. On one hand, you can build almost anything with it and get a job anywhere if you master it. On the other hand, it's weird, ugly, and surrounded by a dystopian wasteland of frameworks and libraries. Don't want to sound like a dick or nothing, but uh, it says on your chart that you're fucked up. Welcome to JavaScript 101. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn 101 different things you need to know about JavaScript, like how to use it, where to use it, and why it is the way it is. By the end of this video, you'll be able to little prerequisites bear with me experts we're gonna double back slow down for a second HTML hypertext markup language is the way that your um, website looks think about the old websites with no real interactivity that all kind of looked boring and the same they looked like a newspaper if you will excuse me and then CSS comes along and it's now the makeup now the color now you can make it bold, you can change the size. That is CSS. JavaScript, fast forward a little later, he's probably about to tell us JavaScript was created. And now that now you have functionality, interaction. You know, you can take a form, you can your button can now move, different things can move. It almost added a third dimension to this 2D situation here to build a website, a mobile app, a desktop app, a server, an operating system, artificial intelligence, and all kinds of other stuff you shouldn't build with it. It was created in 1993 by Brendan Eich at Netscape. At the time, the web browser was cutting-edge technology that see how, see how old that looked? connected everybody on the and Ike at Gents and all kinds of other stuff you shouldn't build with it. It was created in 1993 by Brendan Eich at Netscape. At the time, the So this is mostly HTML here. Yep, this is CSS, the colors. Web browser was cutting edge technology that connected everybody on the planet via the World Wide Web. Now that I've gotten on the internet, I'd rather be on my computer than doing just about anything. At the time, websites were completely static with pure HTML. JavaScript was designed as an easy to use. Mm. Websites were completely static with pure HTML. Every, this is a, um, HTML document here. So you put your tag, HTML, here's your body, here's a header, H1, this is a paragraph, this could have gone, gone on. Your body ends here. You've got your open and your close, and then HTML at the bottom. 
We just trying to we just trying to help everybody, guys. Relax. HTML JavaScript was designed as an easy to use, high level language to help developers make these websites interactive. Today, it's arguably the most popular language in the world, and its standard implementation is called ECMAScript and is the default language in all web browsers. In fact, it's the only code that natively runs in a browser aside from WebAssembly. However, the browser is not the only runtime, and you can also run JavaScript code on a server thanks to tools like Node.js and Dino. As the name implies. Job. What does that mean? So a browser is a front end. Server is the back end. What you're seeing when you're on a website, that's the front end. These are browsers. We use all of this for, um, you know, surfing the net and such. But this is the face of it. This is the front end. The back end would be more like your organs. You can't see our organs, but that's where the real cooking goes on you know your um your database all of your all of your um documents and your data and stuff that's all stored on some server back end script code on a and javascript is now a language that you can use on both versus where the back end is normally a different language server thanks to tools like Node.js and Dino. As the name implies, JavaScript is a scripting language. That means you can execute code on no relation to Java. Don't get it twisted. On the fly by opening up the console in your browser dev tools to run some code that changes the appearance of a website at any time. It's interpreted line by line as a interpreted line by line is important, right? Think about that. It's interpreted line by line. Opposed to other languages like C that are compiled ahead of time. However, in compiled ahead of time, this is binary. This is your code. This is the server. Interpreted is not the most accurate term to use here. Under the hood of the browser, there's an engine called V8. It makes JavaScript run extremely fast by taking your code and converting it to machine code with a process called just-in-time compilation. But none of this stuff really matters. Let's jump into some code. To use JavaScript on a web page, you'll first need an HTML document. See how he did that real quick? Every single HTML document looks like that. HTML at the top and the bottom inside of which will have a script tag. You can write code inside the tag directly or reference an external file with the source attribute. Now to say hello world, use console log, which is JavaScript's built-in tool. Man, you could really follow along with this if he wasn't zooming at 100 miles an hour, but y'all see what's happening. I like, I like this guy in his style of videos source attribute. Now to say hello world, use console log, which is JavaScript's built-in tool for printing to the standard output. Now open the HTML file in a browser and you should see the value printed out. Woo! Look at that. In the dev tools, there are several different ways to define variables. The most common of which today is let. Start by giving it a name, which will normally be in camel. What is a variable? A variable is a container. There's three different ways for you to name this container he's about to explain them case then assign a value to it it's a dynamically typed language which means no data type annotations are necessary in this case i've assigned a number which is one of the seven primitive data types built into the language however we don't need to assign the variable a value right now because it can be reassigned later without an assignment it automatically uses the primitive okay y'all hear that he could have put equals whatever and now this variable here would be that. Since he didn't, it's undefined, which is one of the seven primitives. Primitives is just like a um, the like a, think an atom versus a human. Like it's the the unit of measurement at the smallest point. But primitives is I mean I honestly don't know the proper way to explain a primitive, but I know it's like a boolean null boolean null undefined um integer number string mm, seven hmm dang that's gonna 
That's gonna miss the value me of undefined as its default value. However, we can explicitly represent an empty value using null if I didn't say null. The null. And later on, we could reassign that same variable to a string. It's an entirely different data type, but that's perfectly okay. Now, any value that's not a primitive will inherit from the object class, but more on that later, right now. We're gonna pause because objects are awesome. And I always bring up this Black Mirror ass example where you could really see how people, they try and say that we live in a simulation because with an object, all right, so so this is a string. You're basically declaring it and um, your name could be anything here, but this is an object. These two things here now are calling the function of the object. I might have said that wrong. But then you put curly braces and now you're able to put properties inside of here as you build your object for example you could put anything that you want in there i may be getting premature here because he might start to talk about it later he did say don't worry about it now so just hold that hold on to that and i'm gonna bring it up um later i i, I keep stopping too much we're gonna be here all night we got 10 more minutes let's go now we need to talk about this semicolon. Technically, semicolons are optional because if you leave them out, the JavaScript parser will add them automatically. In real life, JavaScript developers will often fight to the death over whether or not to use semicolons, but let... I have actually never ran into that argument is not the only way to define a variable. Another common option is const, which is used for variables that cannot be reassigned later. But the original way to declare a variable is var. I would recommend ignoring its existence altogether. Yeah, as I say, no one really uses var anymore, so just let and const when you're assigning your variables. And um, forget about var, but basically let is when you know it's gonna change, const is when you don't want it to change at all although you will and one thing about coding okay if y'all you guys bear with me that i personally don't like is how far removed we are even how we're talking about this right now how far removed we are from actually seeing it work in a website because you may be looking at this and you may be thinking okay a variable why the hell would i ever need a variable now i'm gonna try that's why i'm here you know, because you could be just going and watching this on your own. So I'm standing here and sitting here to try and break this shit down into normal language and to also show um, to also show how it's used in reality and to provide some clarity here. So imagine uh, your variable. Hmm. And usually this would be an object, but just to make my point, I'm going to I'm going to use this because I feel like it really brings up drives it home. Or actually, I'm going to save that example for an object. With this one, I'm going to use um, hmm, what's of something that could be a variable that would change. OK, so you could say score. So you're playing a video game, right? And if you're coding that video game, you would say let since you wanted to change, you would say let score equal zero. So now in your video game, score is equaling zero. And then you would write some type of logic in there for whenever something happens the score goes up or it goes down, okay? It's just so that we're not letting you learn all this stuff and it just be piling it on you without no type of anchor. Let's anchor these things as we learn them. We'll find it out in the wild. The reason we have so many different ways to define variables has to do with the lexical environment, which determines where variables work and where they don't. There's a global scope, which is where we are right now, which means this variable will be available everywhere. However, so, man, we're, it's going to take us a long time to get through this if I stop it every single time. So I'm not going to stop and explain everything. Uh, we may need to come back to some of this stuff later because global, but global scope is not that complicated. It's either access to the entire project or inside of the function where you're putting it. If we so if you try and declare a, a variable a certain way inside of a function, and then you try to call it outside a function. Now, what, what are functions? Did he, did he even talk about what functions are? It's a function. With a lot of this stuff, just listen to the name, bro. An object is an object. This is an object, okay? It's a cup. Its property is glass and clear. That's the property. Its function is hold drink. 
would be a function. So now it has an actual function that you could do. So if you declare drink, I'm going to trip myself up here. <laughs> but if you declare a variable inside of a function and then try to call it outside of the function, like if we were creating a function to drink and we put a variable in there and then you try to call drink outside of this specific cup here, it ain't going to work. We define a variable inside a function, it then becomes local to that function and cannot be used outside of it. And see, this is him naming his function. This is when you actually need to use it. And then these curly braces are when you're building it. And whatever goes in here is actually your building of the function. So he's let A equals function. And function is just basically, now you can't use A outside of here. Well, A is global, so you see what he's doing. And finally, if you have a statement like an if condition, variables can be scoped. Wow, now he's adding more functionality to his function. Now we got an if statement. If something happens, then let this happen. It's English. We just got to take our time, relax, and read. Scoped inside the braces or block, unless you use var for that variable, which is not block scope, in which case it will be hoisted up into the local scope for that function. And trust me, you don't want that weirdness in in your life when that's why that's why we don't use var function keyword is used by itself it's called a function definition or statement functions are one of the main building blocks in javascript and they work by taking an input or argument then optionally return a value that can be used somewhere else now functions are just objects which means they can also be used as expressions allowing them to be used as variables or to construct higher order functions where a function is used as all right we're getting tricky and we're not trying to be here all night, so I'm just going to let this rock for a little bit. Put a pin in it. If you don't, if that went over your head, run it back. As an argument or a return value. Functions can also be nested to create a closure that encapsulates data and logic from the rest of the program. Normally, when you call a function that has a variable with a primitive value, it's stored on the call stack, which is the browser's short-term memory. However, when you create a closure, the inner function can still access variables in the outer function even after the initial function call. That happens because JavaScript... We are on number... 37, and we are hitting advanced territory. Lock in. Script automatically stores the data in the outer function in the heap memory, which will persist between function calls. You'll rarely have to think about that as a developer, but what you're more likely to run into... Yeah, I'm glad he said that, because is this. It's a keyword that references an object based on how a function is called. When called from the global scope, it references the window object in the browser. However, if that same function is attached to an object and called by that object, this will be a reference to that object. And you can manually bind a function to some other object using the bind method. This can be rather confusing, but modern JavaScript has another way to define functions using the arrow syntax. Arrow functions don't have their own this value, and they're always anonymous, which makes them ideal for function expressions. Now, one last thing you need to know about functions is that when passing arguments, a primitive, like a number, is passed by value, which means a copy is created of the original variable. However, if the argument is an object, that means it's stored in the heap and it's passed by reference. That means multiple parts of the code might be mutating the same object. Speaking of which, let's talk about objects. The easiest way to define one is with the object literal syntax used. I love that he put const human. This gets back into my theory. With an object, all right, you got your name here, human. The parentheses, is now you're going to build inside of it. So inside here, you would put hair, arms, legs. You know, these are all strings and, um, you know, properties, I mean. And then function would be talk, think, digestion, you know, um, which is crazy. When you think about it, you look outside at all these objects and functions everywhere with properties everywhere. That's why people say that they think we live in a simulation. Um, I wouldn't go that deep, but I definitely see where, you know, you could draw that comparison. Once you learn to code, then you realize that with this browser and with you, you're kind of God in this way. You're all powerful. You can define anything. You could define and name and you, if you sat there and you really worked it out, shoot, you can make your own little world in here that runs exactly how you want to run it and um, breaking all the rules and stuff. So just a little bit of anchoring is what we try to do with these things. So that lets you think that it's some object internet shit, 
let's let's draw these things back to reality so that when you're going through there you're looking through that code and it all looks like mumble jumble you can understand a little better using braces but there's also an object type that can be created with a constructor using the new keyword an object contains a collection of key value pairs or properties and values what's interesting is that Pro objects properties can properties and values so when you're on a website you're you acting as the user is an object and if we were to if we were to look into that we would see probably your first and last name, probably your email, probably the day that you created it, and then probably a Boolean, which is a true or false statement. And it would say, are they active? Are they online? Did they pay their bill? All of these things would be true or false. All of this is happening as you're moving around the website. Once you hit that login, you're logging into yourself as a user. There's certain um, pages that you have access for. So maybe it would say like, user's role, either you're an admin or you're just a normal person, you know, or you're a developer, some type of role within that user object. All of these things are properties when you're, you know, we were anchoring this thing into reality so that you're not just learning objects and don't know what it's used for of key value pairs or properties and values. What's interesting is that objects can inherit properties from each other thanks to a mechanism called the prototype chain. Every object has a private property that links to exactly one prototype. This differs from class-based inheritance found in many other languages. That's also very trippy when you think about DNA and how we pass on our properties to our youngers. Is because we're dealing with real objects that take up memory as opposed to abstract classes in your code. Now what's confusing is JavaScript supports object-oriented programming with a class keyword. However, classes are just syntactic sugar for prototypal inheritance and objects. A class can define a constructor, which is a function that's called when the object is first created. It can also have properties and optionally create getters and setters to access them. And it more easily encapsulates functions by organizing them as methods on an object instance or making them global to the class name with the static keyword. In addition to objects, JavaScript has a bunch of built-in data structures. Man, I shouldn't have let him go crazy like that without drawing examples because he said a whole lot. Um, but we're just going to keep it moving. Structures like an array for holding a dynamic collection of indexed items, or a set to hold a collection of unique items, or map, which also holds a key value pair like an object, but can be more easily looped over, along with a variety of other features. Now, what you should also know at this point is that JavaScript is garbage collected. That means it will automatically deallocate objects from memory when they're no longer referenced in your code. However, when you have a map, all the properties will always be referenced. If that's not optimal, there's a weak map and weak set that can contain properties that can be garbage collected to reduce memory usage. Now that we have a basic idea of what JavaScript <laughs> looks like, let's what? talk about one of its most interesting features, which is its non-blocking event loop. Normally when you write Ooh. code in a script, it's executed synchronously line by line. This is a major, major important information lock in line, which means the next line can't start until the previous line finishes. With an event loop, we can write asynchronous. Let's take a look at this. Asynchronous code, <clears throat> With now that we have this event loop that's just always running on your browser or, you know, wherever it's running, you can write asynchronous code for something to not happen until something else happens. We can get a promise, you use async await, and yeah, that's how, that's how we have everything that we have with the internet. Because if you think about how important that is, what's an example of asynchronous code? Okay, say you're trying to um, log in to a website, right? And mm, is that the right example? Mm, what's a good example? Maybe he'll give us one. code in JavaScript that runs in a separate thread pool while the rest of the application continues to execute. This is really important because modern websites often have multiple things going on at the same time, but they only have access to a single thread for computing called the main thread without a- Yeah, right? Websites would go so slow. For example, think about our Facebook feed, right? Certain stuff has to happen while you wait for certain other stuff. So now this little tiny section can load some stuff in because it's like, you know, once I get that, then display it. And it's always going around checking, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? You know, and, and you can write some code where like, this thing is gonna be presented when it's ready. You send a query back to go the database, back to the backend to go get that information. And then 
everything else can keep loading while it, it's it's cooking and, and now that thing went over there to wait for it, for the request to be returned and now when it's there boom now it's going to show it this is how we're, we're anchoring this this idea asynchronous code it would be impossible to multitask an easy way to demonstrate this is with set timeout which takes a function as an argument but won't actually call that function until x number of milliseconds okay so this is an asynchronous function here i believe you're supposed to have async but anyway um so set timeout it's gonna wait 5,000 milliseconds or whatever this equals five seconds and then after that time has passed then it's gonna console log to the browser, but it will not until seconds then. have elapsed. This is called a callback function because it gets enqueued in the event loop only to be called back later when it's ready to execute on the main thread. Callback functions are very common, but when they're overused and become too deeply nested, it leads to a situation called callback hell. Luckily, there are better ways to write async code like a promise. A promise is a wrapper for a value that's unknown right now, but that will resolve to a value in the future, like maybe a call to a third party API that resolves to some data. If some something goes wrong, the promise can reject to raise an error. Now the consumer of the promise can use methods like then and catch to handle these two possible outcomes. Or better yet, you can define an async function that will automatically return a promise. Then in the body of the function, we can pause its execution using the await keyword to wait for other promises to resolve. And this results in nice readable code. However, in order to implement error handling, you'll want to wrap this code in a try catch block. Now as your code grows in complexity, it won't all fit in a single file. Luckily, we can use modules to share code between files. By default, all the code in a file or module is private to that file. However, if there's some code we want to use elsewhere, like a function, we can make it a default export. This allows us to go into a different file and use an import statement to use the function there as well. It's also I hope you all hear that. So when you're making big projects, you don't have to have everything all on one, on one file. You can write the code to where you export your function and now you can use it somewhere else on another page when you're making these files you're making different pages and um, everything kind of needs to happen on its own the better that you can organize your project then the better it will be so just remember that at the top of your file will always be your imports at the bottom will be your exports the imports what you're bringing in the exports what you're sending out and you can kind of map things through your entire project that way that was, you know, for the noobs out there. Let's get it. Also possible to export multiple values from a single file and then import them by name in the other file. But often what you'll do in JavaScript land is use code written by an entirely different developer. The largest JavaScript package manager is NPM. When you install... It's a beautiful, beautiful thing, man. If it wasn't for this thing, we would not be able to do what we do <laughs> as React developers. You'd have to go back and really learn and really study and really like have to build everything from the ground up but you know i don't i don't talk shit or, or hate on anybody who doesn't know anything but react because i mean we were supposed to stand on the shoulders of giants ever since the beginning with computers and computing i actually learned that when i was watching that um episode with the mic off they were saying that basically the first computer was that thing that they have at the dentist office where you're sliding the thing, the sliding units on a string, and that would help them to count when they were like selling cows and stuff like that. And so ever since then, we've been improving and improving and improving and improving and improving. And improving. So now you got HTML. Eventually you, you go from all this stuff to now HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then React is now a framework built on top of JavaScript. So when you're downloading like Node Package Manager, you're you can download like all of everything so that then unlocks all of these different skills that you can now use, functions and, and everything on your website that you can now use. And the cool thing about it is you don't have to worry about going into them crazy folders. So let me give you guys a a example. Um what is ooh, I probably shouldn't use that one. Uh let me let me let me grab something for you real quick. Open in terminal. Um, we're just gonna go see the um, shoot. What's one of my projects? I'm gonna have to look in here. So this is the terminal I just used to open via Visual Studio Code. I opened one of my files in there. So 
let's look at um oh this this template here so here's the project right it, it let me make it not be so confusing i'll do this the long way bear with me folks so i just right clicked on that and and put um code period now here is our project right My computer is going slow. Okay, here's our project. So you have, this is NPM Manager. You got all of these files with all of this crazy stuff. And anybody can, um, or not anybody, but it's open source, right? You can, you can contribute to this. But you got all these files. It all gets loaded on. So you only have, you literally can download a theme and then only have to worry about certain pages the source these are our pages which are written in markdown so it's basically english this is on a, a portfolio website you would edit this it's basically english and you got your pages here with your components for react but look this is literally you stay from here and here this is only for when you go to get on github you know, so you don't even, you just download this stuff and then we, we keep it moving. But, you know, I'm not trying to promote not knowing your shit. We're going to go back and learn later. But I'm also trying to promote start building now. Don't think that you can't make anything because you haven't gotten to the end of your course or whatever. Pull a package from NPM, it downloads its code into the node modules folder in your project. It also provides a package JSON file that will list out all the dependencies used in your project. Now let's go into the code and assume we're building a website. On the web, the code will run in the browser. When I said those things that you download, those are dependencies that you will use in your project. Which is based on... I'm not going to explain the DOM. You guys got to look that up on your own. I mean, we kind of have... Every website has you know, the DOM, and then you manipulate this with uh, your query selectors and such, but this is what your web pages really are. And it's always the same structure, so if you ever need to do anything, you just write your code to like tap in to change this. On the document object model, where the UI is represented as a tree of HTML elements or nodes, the browser provides APIs to interact with these nodes, with the most important object being the document. The document allows us to grab an individual HTML element using a method called query selector. It takes a CSS selector as an argument and will find the HTML element that has the same class name, ID, or tag name. It returns an instance of the element class, which itself has a variety of properties and methods to get information about it or change its behavior. In addition, we can grab multiple elements at the same time using query selector all. Most importantly, we can listen to events that happen to it, like when a button is clicked. With add event listener, we can assign a function that will be called whenever that event takes place. Much of web development revolves around listening to events and updating the UI accordingly. However, one thing that many developers dislike about vanilla JavaScript is that it results in imperative code, where the UI is mutated directly. Many developers now use front-end frameworks that produce declarative code, where the UI UI is a function of its input data. These libraries encapsulate JavaScript, HTML, and CSS into components, which are then used together to form a component tree to represent the UI. Most importantly, inside a component, data is reactive. It can be bound from the JavaScript directly to the HTML. That means anytime data changes, the UI will be updated automatically. Now, after you build a complete JavaScript app, you'll need to take all of your JavaScript files and combine them into a single bundle that can be used by the browser. To handle this process efficiently, you'll need a tool called a module bundler, like Vite or Webpack. One problem though is that sometimes this JavaScript file can get too big, which affects the page load performance, and this can be measured by the network waterfall in your browser dev tools. Luckily, it's possible to split this JavaScript bundle into multiple files, then use dynamic imports in your code to only import that JavaScript when it becomes needed. Now, JavaScript doesn't just run in the browser, but also on the server. Node.js is the most popular runtime, and you can execute JavaScript code at any time using the node command. This opens the door to 
frameworks like Electron, which combine Node.js with a browser to create full stack desktop apps with JavaScript, or iOS and Android apps with React Native. At this point, you've got 99 problems, and JavaScript is every single one of them. If you want to make life easier, use a tool like TypeScript or ESLint that does static analysis to improve your code quality. Congratulations mm. for reaching the end of JavaScript 101. If you want to go beyond this video, Man, that was great. Shout out to uh, Fireship. I'm going to put this inside the description so that you guys can have that um, reference there. I, I did my best to, you know, drop a little bit of my knowledge on top of that so that we can help people to learn. Uh, if you would like to join us for our open chat, check out the calendar inside of our school.com. You have to be inside the group. That's where this video is going. Shout out to you if you found this for free on YouTube. I mean, our school is free as well, but we just are more structured there. Um, digital builders, we're here teaching people how to code, making it more relatable. And I know the job market is crazy right now, but it's not gonna be crazy forever. You know, we still, if you feel that calling towards code and you wanna learn, we wanna open the gates for everybody. And even if you're not gonna get Go work at Amazon. You can still build something dope with your friends. You can still understand how to code. You can still freelance and help people out. You can still teach children how to code. And come on, this is a digital age. This is a technology age. Don't let these YouTubers make you think that like AI is going to come take all the jobs and we're all not going to be able to code no more. We're not going to be able to work with this type of stuff no more. You're tripping. Don't trip. Peace.